What are you two talking about? Oh, nothing. Just the end of the world. Everybody, to Who Pods the Watchmen. My name is Grant, and alongside me is Clay. And we are talking about episode seven of, uh, of the Watchmen. We are your companion podcast for Watchmen. I hope you guys aren't stepping out on us listening to any other podcasts. Is that weird to say? It's kind of threatening, kind of a threatening <laughs> tone. I mean, <laughs> don't you do it, guys. It's supposed to be inviting. No. Don't you dare step out on us. People take time away from preparing their shopping list for Cyber Monday, and you just threaten them right off the bat. We need this. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, yes, uh, folks, we are talking about episode seven of the nine-episode miniseries. Still thus far, no no confirmation of a, a second season yet. But we are talking about episode seven, which is called An Almost Religious Awe. This one is directed by David Semmel who has directed everything. Mm-hmm. He's the one who actually uh, did the pilot for Star Trek Discovery, which feels like maybe it's a good time for me to go ahead and plug that, hey, I do a Star Trek Discovery podcast as well. It's called Star Trek Discovery Pod. And once the, once the third season strikes up, uh, I hope you guys go ahead and check us out over there and subscribe as well. We do d- deep dive discussions very similar to this, mm-hmm. talking about that show. That was seamless. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is also uh, written by Stacey Osai Kufor. Apologies if I butchered that. Uh, Claire Keichel. Also, apologies. And um, Stacey comes from uh, working on Pen15 as a writer as well as an actor, actress. And then Claire is coming from the OA. And this is the first one that looks like Lindelof, you know, wasn't sticking his blue fingers in. Yeah. 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 That's expression. That's, uh, I'm just going to let it go. <laughs> I think it works. Um, and this was an insane episode. This was wild. This one was super exciting. We got a ton of answers. We like, did. Yeah. Were you expecting all that? I don't think, well, I don't, I don't think anybody was. And they just kind of came wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. It, it was, was the kinda serial. Like yeah. Yeah. It was, we, we now know. What's going on with Beyond? We know what the Seventh Cavalry is doing, and they've eliminated all all doubt about their their alignment and mm-hmm. their views. We now know a lot more about uh, we know about Doc Manhattan. Yeah, and ah, we we're gonna get into all of this. We're gonna get into all of this. Um, it, we're we're still a little bit uh, vague about what's going on with the Millennium Clock and um, what how Vite, Vite factors into this. Mm-hmm. Still stuff to kind of figure out, explore, dive into a little bit more. But we learned a lot. We did. And we're going to be discussing all of that. We're going to be doing a breakdown. We're going to be tearing into all of this, going into our theories about all of that. But before we get into all of that, folks, I just want to say, if you guys are checking us out, we appreciate that. We would love for you guys to stick around and support us. You can go ahead and hit subscribe, like this, go ahead and tell all of your friends, all of that really helps us. Another way you can help us out for free is to go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you're listening to this podcast and go ahead and just give us a review. If that, if it's a platform you're listening to that allows for reviews, please give us a review. Give us five stars. Um, it really helps other people find out about us and they'll come listen to this. And that nurtures our community who wants to talk about this. Oh. Yeah. Uh, another way you can help us out is through Patreon.com. If you go to Patreon.com slash Who Pods the Watchmen, you can make a per month pledge. Give us, I, I think the minimum is two bucks a month. You can give us two bucks a month, five bucks a month. Um, we try to do a little exclusive content for you guys uh, throughout, although I think didn't really do anything this week. Kind of dropped the ball there. Well, I mean, we had Thanksgiving. It was Thanksgiving. We week. had Black Friday. It was very hectic. We had college football. We had, we had college... professional football. All we had a lot of stuff going on. This is this is very true. But you're going to do better. I'm going to do better, guys. I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to do better. Uh, we also uh, we have some iTunes reviews. I was going to read one or two of these mm-hmm. because I thought they were kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Um, this first one says is from Earth versus Soup and says so glad I found this podcast. Interesting insight. Great guys. I'd love to hear them recap other shows like Mr. Robot, Succession, etc. 
maybe um, you guys want to hear me do uh, uh, Star Trek Discovery. Mm -hmm. I do that one already. Seamless. Yeah, <laughs> seamless. <laughs> maybe a little bit more awkward there. Yeah. Uh, I. We also got another review. This one's from Pop215, who said, it's pronounced true, true. Stop saying it the wrong way. And then they gave us three stars. Yeah. So fuck you. I'm, I'm pronouncing it true you through this whole episode just for you. Just for you. That's, uh, can he change it to a one star? <laughs> he probably could. <laughs> he or she. <laughs> they could drop us down. So um, anyway, for the rest of you, please give us five stars. It helps us out. And, and you're going to do better. We're going to do better about our pronunciations. We're trying to say Vite now. We're trying to say true. We're, yeah, it took us. It took us. It took us three months to get Vite correct. Yeah. So, yeah, I can't expect too much. Also, we got another gift. We did. Show them. What did we get? We have a volume two vinyl. Oh yes. Or is it? Is it pronounced vinyl? <laughs> I think it's vinyl. We have a volume <laughs> two. Yeah. Vinyl. I think, I yeah. think uh, Lady Trio says vinyl. Yeah. Yeah, this is awesome. This is this is great. Yeah, we got the um, the first one, which was the Pale Horse. Which, uh, if you're watching us on video, you can see it tucked in back here in our in the background of our shot. Um, and yeah, we got a second one, and they they sent one to you, me, and Mike, who is our uh, s occasional producer here on yeah. the show, <laughs> when he doesn't want me running the boards like this. Camera one, camera two, camera three. Yeah, no, this is really awesome. The production value suite, obviously. Ours are, th are still wrapped in uh, shrink wrap. Yeah, we got the other one over there open. Already. Um, but really fun. They really, I mean, kind of as you expect with the Lindelof type thing, just they kind of play with outside the box type stuff. You know, I mean, even with Lost playing with the whole website type stuff. I mean, you're in, you're more into that obviously than I am. Right. But this is just an extension of that, and it's really cool. I mean, even the warning label here is not an actual warning label for for real life. I mean, it's a fictionalized warning label. Just playing into that whole thing. Like, where does this actually end? You know, it's really cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, I, I appreciate a show that engages in this way with, with fans. They mm -hmm. want to send out these kind of items. I mean, it's completely unexpected on our part. Yeah. We never gave them our address. Somehow they found us, and uh, it, it, that's really rad. Yeah, really cool. All right. So let's dive into this episode. Yeah. First off, like I said, the title of the episode is An Almost Religious Awe. This comes from... Chapter four of the original comic book. I'm pointing to the comic behind your head there. And that was the issue that was all about Dr. Manhattan kind of diving into his origins. And at one point, he's talking about um, how the Vietnamese surrendered to him during the Viet Vietnam War. And he says, the Viet Cong are expected to surrender within the week. Many have given themselves up already. Often they asked, asked to surrender to me personally, their terror balanced by an almost religious awe. I am reminded of how the Japanese were reported to have viewed the atomic bomb after Hiroshima. Hmm. And that's where the title comes for this. And I, 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 we can dissect that in a little bit. For sure. Uh, the premise here is under Lady Trio's... <laughs> I did it. Nice. Under Lady True's care, Angela undergoes an unconventional treatment. Lori chases down a lead. The smartest man in the world delivers a stunning defense of his past actions. Stunning defense. Mm -hmm. And without further ado, let's go ahead and do some hot takes. Oh, yeah. What do you got, Clay? I don't know if I have any. Well, I mean, there's so much to go on. Uh, I just was so impressed by, do you, do you like Frank Ocean? Uh, I don't, I'm not as familiar with his music. Do you know White Ferrari? No. Maybe. Okay. Maybe if I heard it. In 20 seconds. I mean, the song's longer than 20 seconds. One of my favorite songs, and it's actually like three or four songs at the same time, you know, and it just kind of, just like your, your plug for your, your uh, Star Trek podcast, mm -hmm. everything is so seamless and just fits together so well. Synergy. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it was kind of like this. I thought that they, you know, we, within a few minutes of, of you can have an elephant in a room hooked up to, to a memory machine, and a few minutes later see pigs running through this cathedral, um courthouse and farts <laughs> and a million other things and somehow it just really works you know and there are so many different things going on at once i think a few weeks ago i was kind of overwhelmed by how many different things were happening 
And this actually just played it so well, and it was referencing back, and there were these great references of the comic books, and they spent en- just enough time on each little scene to then move on. And I don't know. It just kind of felt like the pacing was really good, and uh, I thought it was awesome. This is, I, and this is like one of the zaniest things I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, this episode really reminded me of what the leftovers, what the leftovers was doing in the last few seasons. Yeah, like it suddenly went kind of bug nuts. It really started running toward the finish line and taking big swings with with crazy concepts. When she opens the door and sees a fucking elephant, <laughs> that boggled my mind. Yeah, um, and I I think that you know coming off of last week's episode, last last week's episode was. Like really, the kind of I, I felt like the pinnacle of the show where it it achieved this this masterpiece of of storytelling, but it's also in a way very self contained. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, I was curious what this next episode was going to be. I thought it might take a little bit of a step back, kind of like slowly bring us back into like what's going on with the plot and like thread in a few things with like a big setup for episode eight. Instead, it just kind of went. Bam, bam, bam! Here is what's going on, mm-hmm. and we're obviously just going to give you a bunch of answers. Yeah. And now you're not sure where we're going to go with the end of this. Yeah, and it was going 100 miles an hour, but it never tripped over itself. No. Which is what is so impressive and surprising. I mean, we even had like, I mean, just such sorry, sorry, but like we even had these crazy kind of zany throwback comic book moments like the floor falling out and she's trying to use the evil you know like remote control that doesn't work like we just had these really funny old school comic book moments in here too right it was wild we do a lot of um rankings of certain things that was my funniest moment yeah the the hitting the buttons on the floor and she's like what are you doing she's pressing different (laughs) buttons like it's a girl like it's a garage door opener i loved it yeah yeah she has had a series of them and then one didn't work fully and then the other yeah, but there is Damon Lindelof. It gets he's known now by a lot of people for not fully addressing a lot of these mysteries that people wanted addressed. A lot of lingering threads and and answers that weren't fully satisfying. And it feels like with this, he's going, "Here's your question. Let's just check that one off. Here's this one. Check it off." Check this one off. And sure, they, they've left us with a few more mysteries. Elephant. But, yes. But I feel like there's a lot of this weight and burden of watching and, and feeling like a lot of these questions are just kind of accumulating that I hope have a lot of that concern has been lifted, right? Um, they've addressed a lot of these biggest concerns, and I'm pretty confident they're going to address the last of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of saying, you know, you can judge me, but not on this, right? Yeah. Which, I mean, yeah, I, I loved it. it. It was it was surprising. It was fun. Like, that's not going to hold us back. Yeah. So before we jump into this, uh, I want to say, hey, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, welcome. We're doing a live stream of this right now. Say hi, Clay. Or not. And I wanted to encourage you guys that uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can go ahead and post them on the chat feed. I know that we're seeing a whole bunch of people already chatting right now. But at the very end of this episode, we're going to try and do a thing where we actually run through it and address some of what the what, what you guys are thinking. Is this a mailbag episode? It's not a mailbag episode. Mailbag episode? Wait, it's not a, that's not a bad thing. We, we just kept juggling with how, how we could uh, engage with the audience after the fact. And I was trying to do it like via Instagram. And it seemed like, oh, that was a little bit... I couldn't like pull it back up afterwards. And if I posted a question thing before the episode, people might just forget to go back and ask one there yeah so people are already chatting there this just seems like oh obviously we should just chat with them right there and to the people listening sorry to the people watching i think we all want to know did you choose this color hat because it matches the dr manhattan blue that was so heavily featured in this episode you damn straight i did yeah and did you know when you started watching the episode oh i know just where to go before i leave the house (laughs) i gotta go get my hat yep exactly need it yep yeah this episode let's go ahead and jump into it The title sequence starts with the staticky TV bio, Manhattan and American Life. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, talking, giving giving viewers who aren't as familiar with the comic kind of a rundown of who Dr. Manhattan is. We actually see Dr. Manhattan, at least this show's iteration, I think for the first real time, 
Yeah, I mean, we I saw I remember we saw him a little like a little blip in on Mars like on the like, CNN destroying feed. something. Yeah. yeah. But here we actually see everything but the head of this body with big chunky legs walking around Vietnam wreaking havoc. Thunder thighs? Got some thunder. Thighs. I, I I didn't notice that. Man, had them looking thick. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> you uh, keep moving. What right. what what'd you think about that? Like I'll just say that you know in one of the earlier episodes, I think it might have been episode four or five, whenever they, they zoomed out and, and uh, showed the squid attack. You know, if you hadn't watched closely or read the comic, you're going to be pretty, you're going to be pretty lost, right? Mm. I mean, that makes sense when you see a giant squid, like with its tentacles going through buildings and stuff. This, I think this was like an awesome way just to kind of introduce people to it and kind of refresh people within like 30 seconds or a minute. And it didn't seem like, I didn't feel like it was patronizing or anything. It was good information. And it worked, and it kind of set up the scene. And I was, I loved it that the fact that it was so Vietnam heavy, and we kind of knew, okay, with Angela, this is going to be in Saigon, and we haven't seen that yet. So I thought it was, I thought it worked well. I thought, yeah, it was very important that they establish at the front of this episode who Doctor Manhattan is for the payoff at the end. Yeah, and you know, we had theorized previously about him potentially walking among us. I thought he was the cactus. You thought he was the cactus. I thought he was which, the cactus. Solid guess. Yeah. But no. And we'll get into that as well. We're, but we are introing, we're welcomed into this world of Vietnam circa the 90s, I'm guessing, early 90s, it seemed. And we're at a video store. There's obvious, it, it's fascinating to see. <laughs> I wrote down all the videos, by the way. Yeah. I yeah. paused, I, I looked at each of these. The videos that the VHS are sitting on there. We have Trunky, the animated elephant, and Tusky. There are two different animal uh, elephant shows, which ends up being a little bit of foreshadowing for the elephant reveal. It had a trunk and tusks. Which also wow. fits into Lady True. She, in, in the original fictional or uh, real life historical figure, maybe fictional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use quote fingers. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how real she is. She might be a little bit. Mostly mythology, but she rode an elephant. She's real to the person who left that three-star review. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> there's a real lady true. Don't mess with her. Uh, there's Porked Do It on the Farm, which is like a TNA screwball comedy from the 80s. Uh, Monsters from Outer Space. Not Outer Space. Outer Space. Yeah. Um, and the, the monster on that cover kind of looked a little bit like Moloch, I thought. Uh, fog dancing, whatever that's supposed to be. Silk swingers, the raunchy pistols, starring Felici, Fel, Felicia Fluffer and Candy Cane Stripper, and mm. then of course Sister Knight, the nun with a motherfucking gun. Yeah, and this was a cool little origin. It was a canon. Yeah, yeah. This is this is her origin story in a way. Mm -hmm. She sees this VHS, and this is the inspiration for who she ends up becoming. Because there's a lot of question. Like we see her and Cal sitting around the table with their kids, and they're talking about um, religion. Yeah, religion and how it's uh, don't believe it. It's it's just like no one believes in that. Um, and yet she's dressing up as a nun yeah. with a rosary and everything. And like, why is she so intent on that? Is there some spiritual side to her? No, it's just that she was really inspired by this film. This VHS test tape when yeah, she was a kid. I, I love the confidence she had in the video store. Like, this is going to work out. Trust me. <laughs> and then her great plan is just to walk out and say, please. Right? <laughs> like, I thought she was going to hide it behind something else, you know, but. <laughs> Still very honest with her, with, with her parents, right? Yeah. 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 That was sweet. And then we get a, a glimpse of what Vietnam is um, post-annexation. And there's part of what the title implies, an almost religious awe. It seems they're throwing a parade for Dr. Manhattan. The, the Dr. Manhattan iconography is everywhere on posters and in dolls and in puppeteering. And what would you make of this? doesn't seem like everybody's happy about it. Not everyone. Yeah. No. There might be a few people who would rather just skip parade day. Yeah. Or make their own statement. Yeah, I mean, I think this the is... The puppet masters. How appropriate that the puppet masters, the ones who want to control the people on the strings, oh, don't like this. I didn't think about that. Maybe. Yeah, I, th I thought it was, I mean, just from kind of an eye candy, you know, not thinking about politics or anything or national identity or annexation or, you know, whatever. Um, for I, Just for the sake of watching it, it, it was a lot of fun. 
you know, it was kind of cool, like, oh, this is what that might look like back then. Right. Or this is what that might look like from a little girl's perspective, you know? And it was pretty wild seeing that and seeing all the revelry and everything um, and the parade. And then later on, I mean, of course, right there we had we had a suicide bomber, you know. Mm. And then later on when she's looking down at her, uh, you know, interesting question. And I'm sorry this is kind of tangential, but look, when she's looking down at her grandmother, was it just that she was not remembering anyone stopping to help? Or maybe people stopped and then ran off to get someone? But it seemed like people were passing by. And then behind her you saw murderer over the Dr. Manhattan uh Art, right? Right. Wall art. And so, I mean, what was it? Was it that they, they didn't want to stop and help or she doesn't remember it or it was just kind of more of this like dramatic effect type thing? Or am I reading too much into that? I I don't know. I mean, I I think there's part of, part of the idea of, you know, not wanting to get involved with someone else's business, even when you see someone dropping in, in the street and the dispassion of society. Yeah. I, I think- there's something kind of true about that, but also it could be a little bit of how she felt in a, in affecting a little bit of her memory. All I, alone, isolated, kind like, of advanced, yeah. We were kind of suggesting that that might have played a little bit of an effect in last week's episode of how Will remembered his history, and it might be a little bit skewed by his personal bias of how he was seeing certain elements, yeah, no, especially in how he was dealing with his kid. Yeah, and I, I did think that was interesting. You know, whenever we saw him looking up um, getting what's his name to hang himself, right? Mm-hmm. He kind of just looked at it and he was pretty resolute and he was watching it happen. And then we saw flashes of her when she, it was her looking at it. She's like huddled over, hunched over and kind of shivering like she's cold or freaking out and scared. Right. Right. So when she's going through the memories, it's not as kind of calm and collected as it was for obviously the person who who created those memories. Yeah. So so maybe it was something like that. Yeah, I just thought it, um, you know, I mean, yeah. So to get back to your original point, the parade scene was pretty wild. I've been waiting to see it. I think even when we found out in uh, episode one that it was annexed, it was kind of this kind of curiosity. You know, mm-hmm. it was kind of cool. Like, oh, okay, I wonder what that would look like. How did that happen? I mean, we know how it happened. But uh, it was it was really interesting to see. And obviously, this is this as we've seen before. This uh, this show is not limited to just race in the United States, but also national identity, um, American overreach, kind of global imperialism, whatever. Right. Um, so it's cool how they can address all of those things in one episode. Yeah. And I think in the very first episode, that's when we see there's still there's a little bit of a parade going on in Tulsa, right? Uh-huh. With the paper mache, Dr. Manhattan, and the people in the streets with the protest signs and all of that. And I wonder if this is a similar kind of D-Day celebration of when... Dr. Man hadn't intervened and and finally ended the Vietnam War and there's this kind of parade that has to happen. Then yeah, one of the posters did say like V Day or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And certainly, like some people kind of buy into it and like enjoy the parade and maybe they're not as concerned with or don't don't really think about what was the larger terror of having this walking god come in and intercede on one country's behalf over another and this is part of that commentary that alan moore is making of like the problem with a superman character is whose side is he on and every side has grade to it and if you're fighting for one country over another you're fighting for such big powers and such big ideals that you can't be purely righteous yeah i think yeah like not not across the board. There's going to be problems with the invader, and like that's that's what we saw. That we saw this guy, um, the the guy with the explosive who got the explosive from the puppet guy, strap on and then go blow up the truck and say death to the invaders. Right, right. Yeah, it's not hunky dory. No. I mean, it's only a generation removed. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I'm I'm listening to you, but I'm just wondering. How much did they invest in education? How are the roads looking? I'm just still thinking about this weird Vietnam that's a state. I don't know. Sorry. It's just a weird curiosity for me. But uh, yeah, to get back to the, to, the, to the point, I mean, you're completely right. And that, that is why it's, it's interesting that, A, Dr. Manhattan is so apathetic, mm. both in the comics and here he's absent, right? And, and B, what will drive him back or would drive him back? And now as the end of this episode kind of unravels, we see, oh, what's going to drive him back? 
Yeah. <laughs> or or, a, a or to the will head. he be driven back? <laughs> exactly, and that's maybe what it takes, at least with the Dr. Manhattan we know from the comic book series. So it's going to be pretty wild now that he's back in the picture. Um, and does he have all of his faculties? Does he remember who he is? Is he kind of reborn, reawakened? We don't know. It's going to be pretty wild. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of like a death of Superman and then Superman reborn, whatever. Yeah, and, and, and thinking about, sorry, just thinking about Angela, you know, this whole, this whole series, she's known this. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's pretty wild. When she's just sitting there, you know, fighting people, you know, just raiding trailer homes, trailer parks, I'm sorry, making pancakes for her kids, or actually Cal, Dr. Manhattan making pancakes. She, she knows this whole secret, which is wild. It's probably the biggest secret in the world at the time. Yeah, no kidding. She's got an ace in the hole, and yeah. she's just sitting there, like, all all calm about stuff. I mean, yeah, it, it explains a lot more of how she can operate with such a confidence and passion and self-righteousness in her own right, I guess. Yeah. She, she's the woman who conquered Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, she's, she has this weird, gruesome nesting doll in her house that she can pull out any time. Well, while we're on the thread of her past experiences, let's continue just, like, exploring that because we get more glimpses of what's going on with her life in Vietnam. We know that she was living in a, a home for girls that was basically a sweatshop where she's having to paint a bunch of Dr. Manhattan figurines. Um, and then she gets... Uh, well, the first the first sequence we see is that she gets pulled in by the Vietnamese police, where she's inspired to the idea of of justice and comeuppance against the people that killed her parents, because they find the puppeteer, and she gets to stick around and hear the execution. By choice. By choice. Yeah. And that's. It's already heavy enough for a kid to have to have their parents die in such a horrific way, but then to, in a way, know the ramifications up front. She knew when she pointed to that guy what was going to happen to him. Yeah. And she ID'd him and then waited around to know that he got a bullet in the head, Mm -hmm. which... Talk about the psychology that's going on there with her. That's pretty damaging. Yeah. Yeah, she's not like other other kiddos. She yeah, she said like I definitely I want to be a police. She's inspired by that. It's it's also, you know, the blue bloods kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's family line. It's in her family line. Yeah. But tacking on to that, like already like traumatized and there's there's also still kind of echoes of of Batman and his parents getting killed in an alley, her parents getting blown up in front of her at a young age. How impressionable that is and how she takes the movie, like her grandfather took the movie as inspiration for becoming a superhero, a costumed vigilante. But then we see June, June? June. 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 Her grandmother come try and rescue her. What do you think of that? I love that scene. That was actually my, my uh, I think, funniest and, well, I don't know about funniest, but it was definitely my Cubes moment. Dark funny? Dark humor? Well, no, not when she dies. I'm sorry. When she says the word fuck in the burgers and borscht. Mm. I just loved it. It was so disarming. You know, it was a tense scene. She's talking about tough subjects. And then whenever they kind of bond over the, 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 the video cassette, it was just, it was really disarming and nice. You know, it kind of felt like a family moment. It felt like such a crossroads moment, too. Mm-hmm. She's there with her grandmother, and she pulls out two objects, and it's two directions in which her destiny could lead, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was like, you can either wear the badge and take on the the line of enforcing the law, or you can take the route of wearing the mask and becoming the, the masked vigilante. And it seemed like her grandmother, from her experience with yeah. really trying to shape what Will did and wanting him to operate outside the law and be the costumed hero. Yeah. That she was like, no, take the sister night route. Yeah. Fuck that badge. Put that away. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it was like, you know, it's sad that we only get this kind of brief glimpse of what her life could have been there being like intentionally shaped to be the next in this kind of lineage. Right. Yeah. It was pretty, it was, it was, 
I mean, you're completely right. And I think also whenever she says, hey, not a lot of people look like you here, you know? Right. I mean, she, that might be a reason too why she settles on that video cassette, right? Try someone like a young black, like what was she, what do you think she was? Like 10? Yeah. Nine, 10 years old? I'd say. Yeah. I mean, she probably doesn't see a lot of people who look like her. <clears throat> and so whether it was Sister Knight or anybody else, she probably did glom onto that, uh, to that cassette. And then finally now, she lost her family, and out of nowhere comes someone else who looks kind of like her, right? And is going to take her back and says, you know, we're family. And then, yeah, that must have been horrific. And now I think one of the unknowns now that, that we have is how did she meet John, right? Yeah, that's and, a huge question because she is abandoned. She, she's lost all of her family. Not abandoned, but she's lost everyone who could – Show her a loving house. Yeah. And how does that shape the type of person she is that she has to become strong and self-reliant and eventually ends up back in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then it, I think it kind of reshapes the question of what is her motivation? She's operating in with an incognito Dr. Manhattan and they've returned to the place where her grandparents her family lived yeah. and it wasn't just accidental because there happened to be a job available it now seems very premeditated and it kind of lends a little bit of a question to like does she have ulterior motives i don't you know, necessarily think so but it, it, it could be as simple as something like you know she meets she meets dr manhattan he decides you know what this hasn't worked for me i left i, I did my own thing Right. Mm. I want to go back in. And the only way I can do this is kind of put the glasses on and be Clark Kent. Right. Right. And so to do that, let's start. Let's start fresh. And she says, OK, you know what? I remember my grandma told me that my family's from Tulsa. Why don't we try there? It's kind of the middle of nowhere. You know, sorry for people from there, but kind of middle America at the very least. And maybe we can just try our luck there. You know, kind of good place to raise a family. And then exactly. they could say, I mean, I don't know. So I don't know if there's an ulterior motive. There could be. There might be. So that would be pretty funny if they do that and they move there for a quiet life, and then it just so happens that the Seventh Cavalry and Keen and the and you know the Tulsa riots. I mean that they may have known about. I'm sure. Well, I don't know if they did. You know, I mean, not a lot of Americans know about it today. So, um, and she didn't really know Tulsa's history because she heard about it just at a burger place. You know. So anyway, is who, it who knows? coincidence? Do you think that everything culminated around where Doctor Manhattan was, and? Everyone else was drawn to the fact that he was there. Say that the Seventh Cavalry found out Tulsa, yeah, and, and or the Cyclops or whoever Keen found out. So he co-opted um, Judd and he co-opted the Cavalry to figure out what's going on and if they can ensnare him. And so this whole the whole machine has been a result of. Him existing in Tulsa, people finding out, maybe even Lady Tro True was drawn there as well because she was aware with her fucking cerebro things she's got going on. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, let me ask you this. Do you, do you think this – I mean we know that, that Cyclops as an organization is interstate, right, mm -hmm. if not national. Um, we know that from the, the map we saw in, in the last episode, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think Seventh Cavalry as well, or do you think that was just kind of maybe? There's likely other cults out there, as we know, and militia groups out there. But do you think that Seventh Cavalry is regional, nationwide, or do you think it was just limited to that Tulsa area? I don't know. It seems like like one of the big answers they gave us was Keen basically outlining what his plot was. Yeah, like we are going to uh, come in here. We're going to. Uh, attack the police intentionally, murder a bunch of them so that they put on their masks. Sure. Or this is what I think uh, Lord Blake basically said. Is this, this what it is? And they're like, yep. That then the, <laughs> For the, the most the, part. But then our, our widow. Yeah, yeah. And then confirmed. use that as a way to catapult him into becoming the president by drawing this tension between masked uh, police officers and, and people who are fighting against that. Yeah. You know, something interesting. I – do you remember in – I guess it was episode one. All those watch batteries. It was like, why would watch batteries be illegal? Who cares? I mean, now, and you know, but there's quirky stuff in this universe, right? Like cigarettes are illegal, whatever, right? Were they illegal? So, what, the watch batteries? Yeah. The I don't know if they were illegal, but it was, it was one of those things where it was seen like, okay, why do they have all these? 
they're up to no good with watch batteries. If I saw somebody carrying around like a jug of watch batteries, I wouldn't think twice. Right. You know what I mean? But now we saw that magazine in the very beginning of this episode with the uh, Millennium Car or Manhattan Car, mm -hmm. and then it had the Manhattan Watch. So I guess it was kind of just like, a, you know, obviously the most energy efficient you can get, right? Maybe it runs forever or something. So I wonder if those are the batteries they're collecting. Is that right? Yeah, and that's how they were able to. That's how they were able to power the Doctor Manhattan machine. They're they're sourcing a bunch of lithium, yeah. and that must in some way play into how they've reverse engineered this device that is able to do. It, it's basically what um, Adrian Veidt used to drop the squid, right? Yeah, they figured out how to do that same thing. Whether this was through Senator Keene having access to documents and records from uh, Veidt, maybe providing it to to Redford, even uh, President Redford, but. Maybe they figured it out. They've, they've been able to reverse engineer, but then they found a link between the lithium that was a byproduct of Dr. Manhattan. He manifested right. it. He created it. Right. And maybe they found out that if they use that, they can use it almost as a magnet to pull him mm -hmm. in, right? Yeah. So if they're tracking how they're using this device to teleport stuff from one place to another, they might be figuring out how they're able to link that and extract that back to the point where they want it. Right, right, right. They're going to use that as like a magnet to suck in Dr. Manhattan. But how do they use Dr. Manhattan exactly. to turn them blue? Exactly. Which, it's tough out there for white guys. <laughs> it's tough out. I mean, I, I love how there is this... Th that's a, a common line you hear from a lot of people who don't think they're white supremacists. Yeah, exactly. They're like, oh, but you know, white people are under attack. I'm like... That's that's the white supremacist line right there. And they're unabashed in pointing that out to the audience. Mm -hmm. And if if someone has those kind of thought processes, I hope it's being underlined, you're a white supremacist. Yeah. And it was almost like it was almost so like a you know, a nod to that that it was like fourth wall or something. Right. Right. I mean it was just wild. And they even hesitated for like a half second before moving on. Because it was just <laughs> hilarious. You almost just see like Lori Blake turn to the camera and go, uh huh. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it, it was kind of perfect. Yeah. I wanted to take a step back because I wanted to point out something that was such a no-duh uh -huh. that I didn't get. Mm -hmm. Dr. Manhattan is Cal. His name is Cal. Cal L. Cal L. Yeah. It was like right there in front of us. The Superman of the Watchmen universe is this, like there's a Superman and his name is Dr. Manhattan or and he's I American, guess... right? It's Cal. He doesn't even have his own last name. Yeah, I was going to say because he takes adopted... Abar. Yeah, he's yeah. Cal Abar. He adopted her name when he took on this pseudonym, became this whole other person, and then assumed this backstory of having a car crash. Mm -hmm. So that also makes me wonder, was there someone else who had a car crash and they replaced the body and just took the documentation? I don't know. Huh. But, Interesting. Yeah. I thought that was like a, ah, oh, they were telling us from the very beginning. And then you look at how Lori Blake was like attracted to him immediately. It was just like, if I had a husband like that, and it's just like, that was your man for like the longest time. Right. That's the same guy. And you, right. Yeah. It was, it's just clever how they're making these like little winks and nods to us. Yeah. There's a lot going on though. So I don't really blame us for, uh, for missing that. Speaking of Lori Blake, mm -hmm. let's talk about her little uh, misadventures here. It seems she obviously taped all of what was going on with Angela while she was drugged out. And was just blathering everything that was happening to her, basically narrating the whole situation. Yeah. So she has a pretty decent idea of what's going on. And she immediately goes to Mrs. Crawford to kind of tell her about that. I love how she, like, outlines, like, here's what I think is going on. And Miss Crawford twists her evil, snidely whiplash mustache and is like, ha, 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 you're mostly correct. That is what we were trying to do. But we were trying to go even farther. Even further. Yeah. What did you think of that big reveal? I thought I, lo was... I loved it. It didn't even, you know, it seemed anticlimactic in a way because we've been waiting for that for so long, mm -hmm. you know. But it just worked. I love that we kind of now have established that. Now we can move on to what else is going on. Obviously, the floor literally fell out from beneath her. You know, I mean, she just shows up to Tulsa to deal with a localized cult. And now we have this. And she's thinking like, holy shit, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think she, she even when she was kind of positing all that do you think she believed it or was she just kind of maybe trying to get under what's her name skin i think in a way she was fishing yeah 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 she's like here's an inkling of an idea of what this could be 
but she was also in a way acting as a little bit of like a, a proxy for us, the the viewing audience, which right. I, I think is incredible foresight by um, the creators of Watchmen that they'd be like, here's what I bet they'll think is basically the plot. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and outline that as well. And then say, ah, oh, you're so close. It's actually a little bit skewed from that. Yeah. And that works because Lori isn't aware of the, the teleporting machines. Right. I, I also, um, she has some exchange early on with Petey, Agent Dale Petey. Yeah. And Petey basically delivers one of those lines in TV that is, is heavy exposition, just like explaining stuff to the audience. Yeah. I am in this place that you told me to go to to investigate these people. Remember that episode five, how that ended? Basically, it's like what he's, he says to her. She's like, yeah, I don't know why you're telling me that, you fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah. It's like I said that verbatim. Yeah. Yeah. But it's funny that she does that. And then she kind of goes over to talk to um, Mrs. Crawford and essentially is, is doing a little bit of info dump as well, which mm-hmm. – it's necessary. I, I understand what they're doing here for this episode. They have to explain a lot of that backstory for it to make sense for the two competing audiences they have. Yeah. The people who are already familiar with the, co- the comic book and those who really aren't. So, that, she, but she still has to kind of like draw lines and like really point things out. And I was like, oh, it feels like you're doing a little bit of what you were making fun of PD doing it just a minute ago. Right. But I think we needed that as audiences. And I think you, I think you agree, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, and looking at that bunker scene really quickly, I mean, now we can all breathe just a little bit easier um, that he's alive. Dude. Or, I mean, maybe he's been kidnapped, but I mean, he seems to be alive. My cubes moment. Uh-huh. LG is alive. Looking Glass is alive. Yeah. We had these three guys come in, uh-huh. or five guys, I don't know. Rolling deep. He, he wiped them all out. So he, he does have the skill. And we were talking about his fighting prowess, and I guess I didn't give him enough credit. You didn't. You you judged him poorly. You know what? You know it's what's interesting? Fire. A lot of them had blood coming out of their. I wonder if he like poisoned them or something, or if I don't know. I mean, how did he kill them? We're gonna have to see something. I wonder if he exposed them to some like psychic blast, kind of like what he was around, or he he had something with the machine. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, he definitely has a little of that Rorschach in him. It's awesome. Yeah, I'm sure we're gonna get. I I hope we get kind of like a scene like. Uh, True Detective season one, mm-hmm. where it's this like nonstop action scene where it's like really tense and him hiding, but then him pulling some shit. You mean like where it's really dark and they're in a maze and it's freaky? Not that like, last one. The one oh, where he's at that house. I never want to see anything like that, that again. drug house. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's alive. One person's missing a mask. Uh huh. So he's infiltrated, obviously. He's infiltrated. Yeah. He's wearing a mask. He's one of the people. He's going to be a background character that comes in to save the day at the last minute. Yeah. And I'm very excited. And he's going to be wearing a mask. He's going to pull it off and be like, it's me. I'm here to rescue you. Yeah, he's going to have that cactus. I got a mustache. He's going to have that <laughs> cactus. cactus. Me and cactus are here to rescue you. He's going to have handcuff keys in the right hand for Lori. And he's going to have that cactus in the left. <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was totally um, one of my Cubes moments. Sweet. Uh, the other one being um, the Cal L thing. Yeah. I was like, oh, of course he's Cal L. Darn it. Yeah. No, that was really good. I, I mean, I, I didn't mean to divert us away too much, but I think everybody, especially after such a heavy, great episode last week, it was nice to kind of get back and realize, oh, yeah, okay, this guy, he's alive. We need him. Yeah. We need a guy like him in our lives. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I want to jump back into some more of this, but. While we're on our little list of like awards we hand out, okay. I thought I'd go ahead and address the other two. We say awards. I mean, we don't have a physical award. We don't have an award. Accolades. But we, we try to remember these little moments and point them out each episode. Okay. Funniest moment. Yeah. The chair? The chair. Or the fart? Uh, Lowbrow humor, maybe? I liked it. I liked both, but I loved I loved the, the, the chair was just so zany. Mm-hmm. It was so classic evil comic book villain. I like the chair. Yeah. What do, I guess, are you a fart guy? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a chair guy. Are you an evil pit man or are you a fart man? <laughs> I would prefer to call myself an evil pit man. I yeah. Guess. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't feel comfortable with either. Yeah. Don't yeah. put me in this position. Put on some deodorant, evil pit man. <laughs> um, and then uh, what was your favorite performance? That's tough. I mean, it's easy to say Angela. 
It's also easy to say true. Mm-hmm. It could be easy to say Pirate Jenny. That that might have been, actually, as far as Cube's moments, that might have been one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. You know, it didn't really add much, but it was just so wonderful. And I'm sorry, you, I know you asked me a question. I'm going another direction. But they're sitting in, like, this shitty Honda Accord or something, right? right. Just sitting there. He's snacking all day. She's miserable, just stuck with him. And then, of course, she just blows right by him, you know? I, I love that. And you wouldn't expect any more or any less from those characters. Can't be honest with you. When uh, I saw that scene... You knew I would love it. I know. I When I saw Angela pull up in the car, I thought that car looked so much like um, the one Cal pulls up in earlier uh-huh. that I thought, oh, is that him? Is that doc- is that him as Dr. Manhattan? And he shapeshifted it into looking like her. Holy I was like, hell. that's going to be so bonkers. Like now he's trying to break in looking like her. For a second, I was like, oh, no, wait. No, she's escaping. She's trying to drive out. I was just like a little bit discombobulated based on the scene that happened just before it. And you're doing too much. Your my, brain's doing too much. My brain's doing too much. Yeah. That's what I thought. You, you, you give the viewers what they want, the listeners what they want. Yeah. Um, best performance. I'm kind of split on this. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think there were a few good ones. Angela did the most. Yeah. You know, so do we, so do we just, is there like a sweat of the brow doctrine here? Where we would just give it to her because she's worked the hardest and she had the most lines. Sweat of the brow doctrine. I yes. That's a copyright law. Is that really for a really boring? Yeah, that's a good term. I like it for in this regard. Something is not copyrightable just because there was labor involved. It still has to have a modicum of creativity. There's oh, your five seconds of copyright law for okay. the night. Let's move on. Let's what, move on. What, no, but what was yours? What was yours? No, best, I'd say best her. performance. Okay. Yeah, I thought Angela had to do more of the heavy lifting. I thought she was really good with this. Yeah. She was captivating, and I I enjoyed it. Although it wasn't, it wasn't as like emotionally, yeah, I revelatory. Agree. Like for for anyone, it was just like a lot of mysteries being like revealed to us, the audience. Yeah, but I didn't feel like anyone was like going through a lot of like crazy like drama that they had to like react to. Yeah, I mean, I'm a crier, and I didn't really tear up this episode. No. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, I think we should talk about Adrian Veidt. In the scene or him or both? First off, let's talk about that badass fucking transition yeah. where it's Angela's eyes and then her eyes take on the uh, the stained glass mosaic yeah. before transitioning to that being the ceiling. And I was just like, I love that. Yeah, it was wild. That was such a good switch. And how they blend what's going on with his scenes with what's going on with the rest of the world. I like how they're transitioning. I am still baffled about how he enters this plot. Where, where is he fitting in? And why did the trial take 365 days? Yeah, how is this a, a year-long trial when she gives a closing speech that was a minute and a half? Yeah. Right? Yeah, that trial was the only thing longer than Scorsese's new film on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, The Irishman. Have you seen that? No. Don't. You're a lawyer. Yeah. What? And you've actually done some courtroom law. I don't know what it's called. Not a lot, but yeah, let's call it courtroom law. Courtroom law. Uh, what did you make of this sequence of, of their speeches of whatever? I can't give you any inside information on courtroom law <laughs> because I don't do a lot of courtroom law, which I'm now going to call it that from now on. Thank you. Um, I mean, it was a great scene. The whole thing was weird. I don't understand why they were in this cathedral. I don't understand why he was wearing a wig. It just seemed really fantastical and fun. We had all the lemmings there. Just some of them were in the the gallery. Some of them were spectators. Some of One of them was, I, I don't know. It was just fun. I don't know why it took 365 days. I don't know why he did not defend himself. Well, actually, that kind of makes sense, right? This is a really prideful guy. And I, I just have to think that if, I mean, do you think he had this planned out as well? Was, that, was there a tear? Did we see a tear? Yeah, that was... One of the aspects, it seemed like he was being flippant about the whole thing, treating it like some silly charade. And at the same time, there was something a little bit powerful about the fact that these robot clone underwater baby centrifuge baby thingies yeah. um, kind of taking him to task, not just for his sins on this Europa moon realm but also the sins of what he did on earth and saying like, do you stand accused of being a monster in both these places of defying rules of being a murderer? 
mm-hmm. and they are finally holding him accountable for the three million people that he killed. So I guess what maybe I was taking from that was he was, yeah, he was outright dismissive of this itself, but maybe this is the first time outside of Rorschach and Dan Dryberg holding him, like calling him out and as being a shithead in, in Watchmen of him kind of reflecting on that a bit more and going, damn, they, they've spent a year calling me out for that. And maybe I do have a little bit of um, yeah. reflecting to do on that. Yeah, I think it was partly that. I think it was also him thinking, I have to go through this to get where I want to go. Mm. And he was just like, this has been so much energy, wasted energy. This has been such a struggle. I mean, he started off tanning hides and stuff like that, right? And building trebuchets and all this. And I think he is kind of, a part of him is just thinking like, God, I've been reduced to this. Not feeling bad about it, but just thinking, I, have, I, have, I still have so much work to do. Or it's, or maybe it's almost over. Do you think this factors into his endgame then? Like he, he anticipated, I'm going to escape. I'm going to send out my SOS. But I know that I'm going to have to endure yeah. this. And the year-long process of this will in part account for enough time that exactly. that message can get there and someone might be able to mount a rescue effort. For I him. think so. Okay. Yeah. And maybe, you know, maybe he didn't defend himself, but maybe he brought up like evidentiary issues or hearsay. You know what I mean? Right. Like maybe that's why it took 365 days. I don't know. Well, then they release a bunch of pigs in there mm-hmm. and everything just kind of gets a little bit silly. Like this episode, like other parts of this episode. Yeah. yeah. But like even more so, I felt like it was just, it was absurd for absurdity's sake. Yeah. And I, I don't know if, I don't know. Did but, it work for you? Yeah, the, the pigs running in and it, like making the whole thing such a farce, yet telling us, the audience, that 365 days were spent on it, it, it made it feel like it didn't matter as well to me. Like, what it, happened there? This, it was a this weird... This is a plot point that doesn't matter. It was a weird kangaroo court... He was already guilty from a pig squeal anyway. Why did it take 365 days? I don't understand it. I don't understand anything about it. But it obviously, I think the timing played in. I think mm-hmm. maybe he knew that it was going to happen. He knew it was going to take that long. And he's waiting for True or somebody else to kind of rescue him. And we see that. I mean, we see the anguish on his face. And then we see the golden statue of him in the vivarium in Tulsa. Right? So obviously they're connected. We don't know. Maybe he was falling from the sky and the land she bought a few episodes ago. We don't know, but obviously like they're she carbonated him. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I don't know. I mean, they, they've got to be connected somehow, and we have two two episodes to uh, find out. Right. So, taking a, a step back from all of that, there was a. I've been noticing. You you were talking about like noticing the color yellow, which. Have you noticed yellow objects in this episode, or were you kind of I was, keeping I would, an eye on to that? I didn't really keep an eye on it this episode. From the get-go, it was that color blue, mm. which, you know, you're sporting right now with your hat. Yep. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think it, this was just kind of the light blue episode. I think there were there were some parts of parts of, that were yellow, but I don't know. I didn't see that. I've been thinking a lot more about how the color red plays into everything. With the last episode, obviously, they're doing that playoff of Schindler's List, Pale yeah. Horse thing going on. With in the black and white, red would be the pop out color. When from the blood of, of the men being dragged behind the police car to the red blinking light that's foreboding of the the room in which they're recording the mesmerism audio to uh, the red folder that he was tracking the mesmerism book, which was red. But yeah. also within the show, outside of that, I feel like red has taken on this this kind of menacing color you have um you have the red pill bottle yeah you have um the red flower that uh, adrian veidt wears on his his uh armor when he gets sent into space which maybe was supposed to track how much uh the plant was degrading over time so he knew how long he could stay out there oh. i was trying to figure out why he would be wearing that flower on his, his outfit a little canary but when huh? he gets brought back it's like all kind of crumpled and frozen and maybe that was like a gauge of of what's going on on the exterior of his suit. Yeah. Um, but then I was also thinking like, you know, you see the, the tomatoes he's growing, the genetic manip- manipulation that's going on there. And in this episode, we see the red flower again, which is in this video. What was it? A tutorial video. Yeah. 
where they uh, pneumodialysis. Okay. That was a tutorial injection she gets. And the red color of this rose talking about the, the cleaning out of the body for, for nostal- nostalgia. I was wondering if they're just trying to be like, if they're trying to tell a little bit of a story with the color red. Like the red of the drip of the blood um, being iconic on the smiley face. Like, it's so hard to say with red because it's always been such a primal, you know, right. kind of carnal color. Um, you know, it's my favorite color, which I think speaks to me being kind of childlike and immature, kind of an arrested development emotionally and intellectually. Mm-hmm. What adult has a favorite color that's red? It's know. like more of a little boy's favorite color. It's my favorite color. My daughter's favorite color is red. Uh, right. But she loves Spider-Man. That's true. I think maybe they're connected, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know with red. That's tough to say. But, you know, I'm thinking just as a sidebar here, did somebody get in, that we know get in trouble on Reddit for doing different things with colors in the MCU? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call me out on that. No, I'm not necessarily calling you out. I just don't really know that much about it. But I remember there was a huge, I remember there was a little bit of a hullabaloo. <laughs> yes. Um, we don't have to get into that. Well, we don't have 45 made, seconds here. I made a bad call. When I was, I was doing a little graphic for Endgame, I I adjusted one image and I shouldn't have done that because it was it, it ruined the whole thing. And the, now that we've seen Endgame, it didn't really have any bearing. I was just doing a funny little theory thing. But uh, How many upvotes you You get? fuck with people on Reddit, they get mad. Yeah, 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 yeah. They banned me from a, a subreddit because I did that. Yeah, the comments were not a happy place for you. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. So, so red, I don't know. I mean, obviously they use yellow like crazy, and I love the throwbacks to that. Hey, speaking of throwback, did you see the? I mean, we saw it, but we saw we saw her eating in the burgers and borscht, mm-hmm. right, with her grandmother, and we actually saw it earlier too. Whenever she was walking, when she left the in video Vietnam. store. Yeah, yeah. Right. The same place. And I mean, we saw that too in the last issue of the comic book. And it's color red. It just caught the eye. Well, there you go. There, that brings it back to red. Mm-hmm. Um, I just love that. And I didn't know that it would play a more central role like with, with the conversation with her with her grandmother. I thought maybe it was just going to last for that quick second that she walked past it. But I thought that was just kind of a fun nod to the comic book. Right. You know, I was kind of looking at those. I don't know how many I saw this. Uh, did you see any other kind of cool throwbacks? Mm, I'm trying to there, think of... Th- there was, you know, um, Dr. Manhattan walking through Vietnam when mm. he's kind of this giant. Right. You know, that was not... I mean, it wasn't really a throwback. It was kind of more... It was an iconic scene from was, both the, there you the, go. the book and then the movie The later. Burgers and Borscht just kind of felt like kind of more of a Cubes moment, kind of something fun. Didn't have to be there. Doesn't really add much. And it's just kind of cool that, that fans will know. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a reminder of like, yes, we're really placing this in the world and we've considered that that's an entity that fits in this world. We can just have a little nod to it. They just whisper in our ears, we like this too. <laughs> <laughs> we're fans of this comic. Uh... Let's talk about Lady Trio. True. Lady True. Uh-huh. This is why we get three stars. Yeah. This is why. And she straight up, like, says she's combat. The Millennium Clock has an ulterior motive. She's using this thing to combat the Seventh Cavalry because um, Will Reeves came and contacted her, told her about this. Because imagine being Will Reeves and being like, oh, I... I'm able to a- have access to trillionaires. I can just talk to them. Yeah. But he lets her know of this vast and insidious conspiracy. And she's on board to try and help save him, save the world from them capturing Dr. Manhattan and trying to use him to make a lot of white supremacists into Dr. Manhattans. Right. MAGA. Do you by that that is her sole motivation no and not thinking anything negatively about her but just it just seems a little too gregarious right you know i mean she has to have her own i mean who's her dad where's her dad she has to have her own side you know her own play going on as well we got this was the theory that we had posited on this show before mm-hmm. we had read about it anywhere else, but that the possibility that beyond was actually her mother. And that was, that was confirmed. And I was like, fuck yeah. Yeah. But the idea that that's her mother and she's been feeding these thoughts into her mother, uh, slowly through the IV drip and then addresses the father. What do you think that is? I think she's cloned the comedian and he's going to be in this too. And 
That's going to be such a mind fuck for Lori Blake. And if we tick off all these characters, they're all being brought back in to this show. You have Silk Spectre. Dan's in prison, but he exists somewhere in this realm. And if it's if the theory holds that the SOS message that Vite sent from you, Europa, okay, it's getting so bonkers. But if his save me D was actually intended for Dan, maybe Dan breaks out and actually goes and rescues Why him. Why wouldn't it be Doc? Could be Doc. Um, that's very possible. Probably could get there a lot faster than one year, but whatever. Um, and then you have uh, who else? Uh, Doctor Manhattan. We just found out where he is. And then bring in who uh, he comedian. is, who he is, and does true did true know that? Because you know, whenever whenever Lord, uh, not Lord, whenever Angela was leaving, she says, "You didn't ask who." I told you he was here, masked, right? And you I, didn't, I and you didn't she ask knew, who. They both knew, and at that point, she's like, "Fuck, they know," and I gotta go. And I gotta did, go and, awaken and him. How did she know? Mm. She's got cerebro. She's got yeah. that blue globe that's been spying on everyone, and. That's creepy, you know? Mm-hmm. Talk about privacy. Yeah. Holy smokes. Especially since they... A little Zuckerberg action. Since they gave us the episode with... Um, she killed. She was killed by space junk, where Lori's talking very privately into that, and there's really emotional moments. I thought that was a great glimpse into what an invasion of privacy that is, and what we can glean from Lady True's character that she would do that, that she would listen to all that with a shrug and, like, she's entitled to Very it. Very vite of her. Very vite. Yeah. Which, when I'm, I was asking you, do you think her motivations are, are that altruistic that she's just trying to stop them? No, not at all. Yeah. I think she, I think with the idea that she's revealing she's trying to have her parents be a part of this, she's trying to have a, a degree of a reckoning with the annex, the force annexation of Vietnam by the United States, and that's what when she activates that clock, there's going to be her her version of saving the mm-hmm. world mm-hmm. is going to I think play a lot with whatever was uh, beyond her mother daughter was doing with those questions. Yeah, when she's prompting yeah. Angela with those questions, what her dissertation was. The adaptive function, if empathy and the role of rage suppression of empathy and the role of rage suppression in social cohesion. Well, I mean, remember, didn't we have someone talk about it could potentially spray a version of of nostalgia, making people more empathetic towards others? Mm -hmm. And she was talking about the idea that the problem with nostalgia was that people would just linger on their fears. Mm -hmm. They would linger on the most traumatic moments of their life and they couldn't move out of that to focus on positive memories. I think there's, I mean, there's something very real about that idea. Yeah. Like I think that all of us humans, we think most when we reflect back on a lot of the things we regret, our regrets, our, our pain, the stuff that we wish we could do over. But Maybe it's not so much that we wish we could do it over as we we almost like want to self-flagellate. We want to bask in the wrongness of what we did so that we can wallow in, in guilt and shame. Well, it's also a teaching moment, right? I mean, you want your kids to fall down sometimes. So they kind of learn not to and learn how to how to walk or run a little bit better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like pain is is something that's instructive. And also, you're right. I mean, I guess... There is that idea that the only thing holding you back is yourself, and a lot of people would rather wallow in that than have the self-actualization and that fear that comes with that thinking, okay, now, I've, now I'm actualized. Now what do I do with my life? What's my grand plan? You know, what's, the, what's my story? And that's tough. You know, like a lot of people talk about getting scared if they, if they win the lottery because then they think, what's next? You know, you're not tied to a job. You're not tied to this or that. Now you actually have to make real decisions well, actually i mean i guess if you're, you're a millionaire you don't have to make real decisions you can, ha- <laughs> you can hang out like order in right you know but um yeah and there's something really you know thinking just also her speech is a total like silicon valley ted talk speech mm. you know she's all like you know bootstrap kind of thing um believes in the individual she's 
not bragging, but at least listing her successes. It's it's just kind of a self self indulgent moment for her, you know. So you didn't you weren't buying it necessarily, or I wasn't not not buying it. It's just kind of she's kind of like she's kind of like Vite. She lives she lives for that, you know. She she appreciates that and enjoys that. Just like in the comic book, you know, we have him sitting there at his desk, kind of like how Trump envisions himself, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like where he's sitting in his desk and all these people are coming to him with important questions and he just signs yes or no or, or whatever, signs right. a check, you know? Vite lives for that. She kind of does in a way too, although she actually seems to be doing more, well, I can't say substantive, but she's actually kind of putting her money where her mouth is. I mean, she's moved, not many people are living in Tulsa. And again, that comes to your point from earlier in the show or in the podcast, why is she in Tulsa? Is it because people knew or were attracted to Manhattan's energy? It's the center of the United States. She now, now we've seen that she's working with Hooded Justice, who has mind control technology. He brings that to flashlight. the equation. Um, there's this idea of the, the flashlight um, being used to control people, the nostalgia pills being able to uh, force memories upon people. And what might be her ultimate goal? Is she going to use the millennium clock to activate and manipulate people to do what she wants? Or is she going to force people to have a reckoning with their past? I'm not really sure what her end goal might be with a clock and how that might be also used to thwart. If that is also her mission, the seventh cavalry of what their goal is to turn a lot of white supremacists into blue supremacists. Right. Did she use the elephant to come up with a maximum dosage kind of limit for nostalgia or memories? You know, like if you're thinking, how much can I disperse so until it has a negative effect or a, or a fatal effect? Mm. The elephant can obviously take a ton. Yeah, and elephants never forget. So they can remember everything. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> they already they already have all these crazy memories from you know, I work, hoping, working the beat in in New York. I was hoping that line would oh of course it's an elephant because an elephant never forgets. That's what I was hoping would happen. Yeah, but that's why I'm not writing this show. What that, did, that'd be awful. What did you think though? I mean, we had this when she opened the door. We had like the cell bars, like, you know. Oh, I thought maybe for some reason he was going to be behind bars, um, like yeah. they were holding him there. Because he was trying to get to to Angela. And it sounded like there was kind of like this Darth Vader breathing apparatus. You know, so I thought, okay, maybe he's on his last leg and they're kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, she's going to see him right before he dies. Yeah. Here's, speaking of that, mm-hmm. she's a trillionaire, right? Uh-huh. And all it takes to break into this this space age door is a rock to the, the, the red device, or the green whatever door lock. Yeah. And it just pops open. Yeah. Also, when she's giving her speech before the debut of the Millennium Clock, it's on all these screens that are glitchy all over. And I'm like, you're a trillionaire. Fix that. <laughs> What's this glitchy element? And I was like, is this just that they were concerned in the, the visual department that we need to know this is a, a TV being projected? Because I, I feel like there was no concern there. I was going to know right. it's a TV projected. I don't need to see all the, the... I think that's what it was. The glitches of technology. I think that's there. what it was. She's a trillionaire. Yeah. Well, she's spending a lot of money, though, you have to think. Yeah, and that and that cumbersome um, hologram communication device it just seems so tedious. What in the world? She puts a Frisbee on the ground. <laughs> yeah. You got to carry that all around and like drop that whenever you want to activate it? Yeah, that was one of those weird... I, I don't know. I mean, were we supposed to be impressed by that? I think it's supposed... If if they're living in like the nineties, it's it's like laser disc or some shit. It's like this is how things were so big and awkward back yeah. then. Like, oh you have cool technology, but it comes in a MacBook that is gigantic and jelly colored on the sides. I mean, again, if it is like Vite, if she is like Vite, did she know that Angela was going to do that? Was was it planned that much? I mean, she has so much stuff going on. Mm. I mean, could she really plan that down I- to the T? I appreciate that they're like, oh, we didn't think you were going to take all the pills at once, mm-hmm. but we definitely wanted you to take them. I, and so you would start kind of living out his memories. Another thing that kind of surprised her was when Angela said something about her daughter. Mm. And she really seemed to be surprised. Like, oh, you know that? 
Oh, you are a detective. Wow. You're piecing things together. Wow. Anyway, I mean, did you did you think that was authentic? Yeah, but I think her directness and honesty about a lot of this is also pretty authentic. I, I, it yeah. strikes me in a way similar to Veidt at the end of the comic where it's like, where, what, what was his line? Do you, do you take me for a, a Republic um, villain or whatever? And Waiting like, till midnight, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I already did this 35 minutes ago. You, yeah. I wouldn't tell you my plan if I hadn't already ensured this was a done deal. And we almost started, we all, we started getting that with Keen too, mm. which Lori then, then, then cut off, which was funny. Yeah. yeah. She's like, eh, shut up. I, I'm not, I'm not going to give a shit whatever it is that you're trying to tell me. Yeah. But that makes me start kind of guessing like, oh, has whatever machination that she's intending already begun to take place? Or will it have already taken place just like the comic before, like before the final episode? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like next episode, it's got to happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. They got to be activating the clock. The damage uh, I is would done hope so. and it's the repercussions. Yeah. Okay, so uh, question time yeah. from me to you. Okay. What will... I mean, it, it's your understanding that... They both uh, look the same. It's your understanding that... Yeah, oh. right. <laughs> it's your understanding that Looking Glass will rescue Lori. Yeah, I mean, I think that he. And when I say understanding, hope, understanding, wish, hope, desire. Hope, I think, is more accurate. Okay. But I think that's what they've set in place is that he is that that last active agent that we're supposed to kind of forget about for a little bit, and then he'll pop back up wearing the mask and be like, yeah. "Oh, that's the problem with your masks. Anyone can infiltrate." Oh, right. And Lori will say something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, question number two. Okay. Will Petey survive? He does Petey Petey. Will we find out that he's Lube Man? Oh, that's right. Will we find out that he is the blind, what did I call him? The blind minnow? Blind salamander? The blind salamander? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I would guess he's he would survive. He's our- He did Petey Petey, so does that, does that mean he survived? Yeah, like I figure if, if he's going to be our link to the greater- mythology and they want to do a second season they don't want to get rid of pdpedia they'll let him survive to kind of continue telling on the tale telling the tales in the off season if man i hope there's a second season pirate jenny does she survive no oh we always think she's gonna die <laughs> <laughs> i think every episode we're like uh pirate jenny you, i mean that's gonna like die. you talk about the rose on the outside of Vite's uh, armor being the canary in the coal mine mm. she she's the real canary in the coal mine she here is. you know we know when she dies something's up yeah so it's, shit's going down so like, next question okay how will angela um explain the death of the kids you know their father to the kids a hammer to the head Right, that was so brutal. When she just like I turned away. It was one of those I I can't watch that. And the music, oh. um, Life on Mars, but it's like extra slow. The piano, that Bowie it was song. just piano. Yeah. yeah, it was so great. Oh, it's one of my favorite songs. It, I don't, I don't think she, I don't think that's going to be a concern right now. <laughs> I don't think not she's right going now. To have to be like kids, full house moment. Come gather around. Let's sit and talk about this. And what was in the back of the truck? Was it one of those machine guns? With the Seventh Cavalry, because they were they were they were uh, they had their house staked out. Mm. Remember, it kind of looked like the similar build of the machine gun we saw in Episode One. Are they just going to blast her house? And he's going to get whose house? Oh, Angela's. Angela's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, is he yeah. just going to get in front and then deflect all the bullets, and then we know that he's he's the second coming? Yes, maybe. I like that idea. That'd be cool. That would be really rad. Yeah, they have a great corner lot, by the way. You like corner lots? Are you, nice. are you a corner lot man? No, not so much. Really? Are you a cul-de-sac man? I think corner lots are like. I mean, I know you're at you... the edge of tra- like two-way traffic, and you're like, oh, you hear it on both sides. Oh, okay. A lot of lights in the window. Yeah, I want to be like just tucked in in the middle of the street. What about a cul-de-sac man? I can see the appeal if like everyone's having like a cookout or something like, like oh, a little community. How, how is that? Oh, you mean like a neighborhood yeah, watch, a neighborhood neighbor- watch party? Neighborhood little, yeah, a little block party. Yeah. Do you think there was anything special with Angela's adopted kid who had the like staples? Was that was that part of the toy or is that kid like telekinetic? Yeah, I totally thought there was they were trying to allude to him being a connecting point, especially since he's building the same kind of castle. What's going on with the linkage there? Is he Walt from Lost? Does he have <laughs> special psychic powers? Right. Right. I don't know. I 
I don't know if that thread is only ever going to be picked up or if it was just a red herring. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they knew with a show like this that they're going to have so many mysteries be a part of that they wouldn't just try and sprinkle in some red herrings here and there to kind of throw people off the scent. Okay. Well, Lori, I mean, sorry, this is just rapid fire. <laughs> you have a lot of questions. Will Lori, will John kind of explain things to Lori a little bit or will we understand their story a little more? Um, yeah, I think we have to, mm-hmm. they got to explain that to us. We have to figure out what's going on with the background. Why, why is she even with him? I, I mean, we don't, wait, have... wait, 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 why is she with him? We're talking about Lori. Oh, Lori. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about, um, no, 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 no. Yeah. Will there be a moment like whenever Dr. Manhattan shows up with Angela and Lori's like, Oh, now you've come back. All right. Kind of have one of those, not, not cat fights. Sorry. I don't want to be like that, but you know, will we have a, I think like there's got to be an interaction there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, right now she just has Petey. Right. It's like, you know, you show up to the high school reunion with Petey. <laughs> you're not staying long. <laughs> you know, you're going to make a quick exit. There's my ex, and Petey's like, fuck me. Exactly. <laughs> can compete with that. With Dr. Man. Okay, Will, I mean, sorry. Sorry for the younger audience. You know you like to bring it up every episode. I'm doing this for you. This is your Thanksgiving miracle. This is your late belated birthday present. Thank you. Will Dr. Manhattan be nude? What, what will Dr. Manhattan look like? Because will he look like um, that actor? Nah, no, nah. no. Nah. It's gonna be some other, a whole other guy. Do you think he's gonna, gonna be? He's gonna look like John. You think he's gonna look like? Um, yeah, Mr. Phillips. He's gonna look like the Limmings from, from Vice. He's gonna look like the Limmings. Yeah, absolutely. And that's who she fell in love with, and then reskinned him. Essentially, reskinned him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. She got into the customization settings. You know, in the, when you start the video game, and she kind of gave, yeah, yeah, that's, look. that's that sucks for him. Why? I don't know. I well, kind of want that actor to get a chance to be Doctor Manhattan now. You mean for, for for you mean Cal? Been, yeah, you mean Cal? Cal? Since Cal's been laying low, he's got his time though. I love that dude. Yeah, he's great. God, great husband, great father, great he, looking dude. Fucking, he's he's lying on the couch reading Hemingway and Chinua Achebe. This guy loves the classics. He loves reading. He loves reading. He loves the classics. He's, he's not getting, sitting there slack jawed watching Watchmen like the rest of us. He's not no. watching American Heroes story. He's doing the right thing. And you know what? Do not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. And that's very interesting, too. Kind of prescient. I mean, that's, you know, the Hemingway novel. That's the poem he took the title from. Stop asking for, you know, for whom it tolls. It's tolling for you, dude. Like, your time's up. It's all about death, right? And, and he your took, time's up. And You're he, getting a hammer to the skull. He took a hammer to the skull. And she pulled out the, the little hydrogen, but it's like a tangible object. It's not just something he traced in his head. It's something he implanted oh, yeah, into I, his I, head I, I, I to could, make some part of his brain forget and, and have total amnesia. I couldn't play that. And I yeah, Lady Trio, comple- Lady True completely knew when she's mentioning like, oh, so the complete amnesia. That doesn't happen. So I'm calling bullshit on this car thing. Interesting, yeah. So, so yeah. she knew. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, a couple more questions and for the, you. The question is, like, how long did she know? How long has the, does the 7th Cavalry know it's him, or do they know that he's just in Tulsa? Are they able to sense with their technology that he exists in Tulsa, and they've known for at least three years, which is when they first attacked the police, so they're kind of causing a, a, a little bit of chaos in, in the region to make anonymity in their actions, like, work a little bit better. Question. Okay. Did the police chief know that Cal, did, is that why he befriended Angela and took care of Angela? I and think ma- so. maybe saved Angela during the, what did they call it, the White Knight? The White Knight. Huh? I, oh, do you think he knew about Doc Manhattan? Right. No. I mean, she, we have maybe. to remember, she was knocked out, and she, there was a gun to the head, and all of a sudden, we don't know how she survived. Yeah, I think that might have been him, and he knew. Mm-hmm. Man. I think you're right. This and I, I think I think you talked about that too, just just to give you credit. Right. We didn't know why, and we certainly didn't know it was because Cal was Doctor Manhattan. But uh, so they kind of know he's there, and he's just like this homebody, stay-at-home dad who's just like chilling in in sweaters, making all day, making reading pancakes, books, making pancakes. Yeah. Do it. He's like, they're like, ah, just leave, leave him be for now. We can't really fuck with. He's that. in the he's in the carpool lane, dropping the kids off. Yeah. Yeah. Just nice, nice and chill life. Yeah, it just gets you know revs up some Disney Plus, watches a little Mando every Friday night, <laughs> watches a little High School Musical, the musical, the series. Okay, can I do a couple more questions for you? you? Yeah. These are kind of rapid fire, and I'm just thinking of them as I go. Okay. 
do you think we're going to see uh, um, Will? Will there? Will, I guess will will we see him, and will there be like this heart to heart moment with him and Angela? We will. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. You like that? No, yeah. I, I, we definitely have to see him again. Yeah. Once more. Okay. What's the elephant for? See, I don't know. I I, I liked your idea of like having a large creature. I, obviously, the historical Lady True and the elephants being a tie-in. I, I get that they might want to use an actual physical elephant, but why that would be linked to her and this kind of siphoning off of memories, I guess they can. They feel they can safely put human memories into an elephant, yeah. and it it's not like, fuck the elephant, I guess. I yeah, don't know. Right, right, they, right, don't, right. they don't care. Right, yeah. But I, I, mean, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. it, maybe their technology, that whole... Um, tutorial thing was bullshit. And yeah, they just need to uh, give her time. Kind of dump it, it, dump it, and yeah. It may may have been just them completely fucking with her. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. But I doubt it. I, I would imagine the elephant had some sort of purpose. Okay, do you think there's a possibility, like you said, you know, what is True's version or thought about saving the world? What if it is crippling? You know, the most antagonistic, aggressive global superpower. I mean, we can talk about whether that's Russia, China, or United States. But as far as army bases and stuff, it's the United States, right? Yeah. So if she crippled the United States and Vietnam was able to regain its nationality and then other countries were able to kind of just do what they wanted without intermeddling from the United States, could you see something like that? I mean, all, all I mean, I guess I another part of this is that we know Lindelof loves Watchmen, right? Mm. We know that the last issue of that comic book was, or I guess maybe the last two, were, were wild. Nothing right. you would expect. I mean, we have a job. We have three million people dead in New York City all of a sudden, in the in the uh, you know outer areas of that. So he's he might not he might want to do something similar. Could this end at the you know at the end of episode nine with a crippling of the you know, entire United States of America? I kind of think so. Yeah. It's like the end of the age. I mean, it started with, I mean, Lady True's, Lady True's beginnings started with, or her mother, you know, has memories of Agent Orange and destruction in, in this little vi- village in Vietnam. Mm. So it's the, not the apex of, of America, but certainly after World War, after World War II, we're in our apex, right? So now is it the end? And will we see the end of the United States? Maybe not as a country, but definitely weakened to the point of not being able to go into other countries. Yeah. And I guess follow it's, up. Go it's got to be the, this kind of tearing down of the norm of this this world, of the United States being this superpower, taking control back. And if she wants to bring peace to the world, maybe in her view, her lens, is that the United States needs to be destroyed. Yeah. Maybe it, it is evil, and that's part of the reckoning as well. And how is she going to do that? I don't know. Yeah, I, it, I don't. I don't fully have a, a decent guess. And this might made a deal. It could be hypnosis that has us tear each other apart, like in the movie theater, right? Yeah. Um. And maybe Vite is trying to get back to to prevent this. Maybe he recognizes that this is going down the same path he did, and he's going to try and stop True from doing the same thing he did. Because maybe it didn't matter. The world tensions are still there. But I guess we're not seeing that. We They haven't yeah. been like suggesting that there's an escalation of arms race or anything anymore. No. Seems to be like there is a degree of harmony still that's been maintained. Yeah, uh, at least on that level. Right. Will we see Vite on Earth next episode? Mm. It's almost like if we don't, it's a little too late. Right. Don't you think? I mean, I don't want to just fit him in at the end. I mean, he's he. They've included him in in all but one episode, and it's been Wiley e. Coyote, it's been Zany, but it's been for a reason. You know what? I'm kind of anticipating the episode's going to be mainly him, mm. and then we'll get what's going on in Earth in about the length of like we got hit with him. Huh? But I don't know, because then it would bring everything together. We got two episodes left. Yeah, yeah. You think the last episode's going to be like a sweet hour and a halfer? It's got to be, in which case we need to push this back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, Our start time's going to need to be a little later. We'll okay, that, that's the end of my rapid-fire question. Yeah, a lot. Uh, we can move on. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to point out before I'm going to jump into uh, looking at a lot of what people were commenting on here. Um, I wanted to point out that at the moment that Angela is by the blue globe and Lady True enters into the room, did you notice how the light was hitting her face? I did not. It was hitting her face in a way that made her eyes glow separate. And at first, it kind of looked like um, it looked like she was doing what Will was doing with the white makeup right. over the eyes to brighten them and contrast everything. But as she got closer, it was the blue glow. And it was like we had the black and the white of, of Will and then his granddaughter, Angela, uh, or white and then black yeah, yeah. of, of the, the, the face mask. That they paint on, and then how light was bathing her in a blue mask it was like the world is black and white, but there's this third element the, uh. in the equation. There's this this blue god. There's this gray area, but it's actually a blue area. I I thought there was just it was clever lighting. Yeah, I was really kind of taken. I didn't that. even notice it. Ah. I'm glad you did. Well, maybe it was the thing. I'm not sure. I have nothing to add to that segment, but I'm glad you noticed it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and check through here and read and see if I see if there's any particular thoughts or questions that you guys are asking on our thread. We have any soul sauce? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if everyone's going to have the, the same names here as Damn. on Instagram. Oh, that's, right. that's true. Uh, Jeff Thompson says, oh my gosh, guys, I need this pod so bad. I just got to talk about it. Wow. Holy crap. Oh my God. Every other version of the same sentiment. <laughs> I absolutely love this show. Nice, we agree. Yeah, we yeah. fucking agree. This is so cool. Uh, B Mob B Mobma twenty one says, "I guess the Excalibur theory was correct." I don't know what this Excalibur theory is. Maybe, maybe they'll mention this a little bit further down. Excalibur, in Age of Apocalypse comic book. Do you think it's related? I think it's to related Age to Age of Apocalypse. Yeah, no. Uh, a lot of people just being like, "Whoa, holy shit!" Yeah. Um, they also thought that it, uh, potentially Topher. Might have been uh, the Dr. Manhattan. Yeah. Which, yeah, could have been like a yeah, red yeah. herring there. Um, and then... Question, really quickly, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. If Dr. Manhattan was in Cal's body, what was Dr. Manhattan doing on that CNN news feed? I think that... Was that dated? I think that was manufactured by Lady True. I think oh. she was making it seem like he's on... The planet, but he was like building and tearing down the castle, uh, 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 or Vite's he was castle. tearing down, yeah, Vite's castle. So, yeah, 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 I don't know. So what's going on. she says he's not on Mars. She says that with a certain degree of authority, uh-huh. which makes it seem like she's the one actually manipulating what is being seen on Mars. Oh. That's just a thought. Yeah, good but thought. why would she show that with a castle? Just to fuck with people. That I don't like. But why yeah. put in the castle at all? That's. That is really weird. Um, someone said, let's see, uh, Joe Dat Dude, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. says, is Cal the doctor or is he the communication device? Since she pulls that thing out of the head, he's him, right? Uh huh. He is Dr. Manhattan. And she isn't pulling this device out of Cal in order to contact a Dr. Manhattan elsewhere. Ah. Uh. He, he's got to be him. And she. Took whatever was implanted in to make him forget, and he's going to be reborn as this other guy. That's what I assume. Nesting doll? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a nesting doll. Russian nesting doll. Uh, Painted Brandy says, I support more pig courts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Instead of the kangaroo court, we now have the pig court. <laughs> Jeff Thompson says, wow, you guys don't do enthusiasm, do you? You sound like you're talking about decorating. Does I will sound about boring? I will say that I mowed the yard and raked. My allergies are awful today. <laughs> so uh, I apologize. I thought this was like, I, I mean, I think I did say, though, that this is maybe one of the zaniest episodes of television I've ever seen, but it worked. So, yeah, if you want to see me at my best, maybe go back a couple episodes to the Looking Glass, you know, episode. <laughs> That's what you need. I was yeah. a little bit more awake for that one. <gasps> Floyd Coleman says, X Cal a bar. Cal a bar. Holy Ex-Cal-a-bar. smokes. That Formerly was the theory. Cal- man that's pretty wow. good um history eraser button says i don't get the hate for this show it is brilliant yeah is um, there hate for it i mean you've been looking at things more than me and i haven't looked at anything so yeah low bar. Y- you know there's there's people that feel like it's woke culture 
Oh, really? And that they feel they're being preached to, and they don't like being called white supremacists. Uh huh. <laughs> so generally, white supremacists don't. Well, people don't are like trying this. to stop using the word Thanksgiving now. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh yeah. According to the real Donald J. Trump Twitter account. Shit. Yeah. So we got to watch out. It's it's tough out there for white guys. Yeah. Can't even say Thanksgiving. Um. Beat to Death says Fog Dancing, that VHS in the beginning, uh-huh. is an in-house book written by one of the guys kidnapped to the island in the original comics. Oh, okay. Cool. Ah. Very cool. I didn't know that. Uh, let's see. Do you have any more questions while I'm reading through this? You know, what kind of burger did that Burgers and Borscht remind you of? <laughs> that's, what, that's the question you want was to it, was it? No, 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 no. For me, though, when I saw it, it looked like a classic in and out it looked like an in and out. Five Guys? No. You think it was a Five Guys? No. You think it was an in and out No burger? way. Where'd they shoot this? They shot a lot of this in Georgia, right? Do you know how salty Five Guys is? I'm not saying I like Five Guys. No, I mean, I, I'm not saying I don't. But my God, you better have like a 20 spot to pay for Five Guys. It's expensive. <laughs> uh, Timothy Reynolds says, Angela, freak, uh, Angela freaked out. And terrified perspective on the hanging was after Will had been strung up by the racist cops, not uh, while Judd hangs himself at Will's command. Okay. Uh, okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh, okay, thank you. Um, History Eraser Button says the child actors in this show are so good. Um, the young Angela scenes are so captivating. I think that's an excellent point. She was great. Yeah, we, we didn't really talk about that. I think because they were kind of just interspersed. You know, it wasn't like, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I, th- I thought she was great. Jeff Thompson says, I think Petey is going to rescue Lori as Lube Man. Oh, yeah. Can just you imagine we're expecting, right we're expecting Looking Glass and then Lube Man slides in? I wouldn't mind either way. Like, he, like, like it's a win-win. He is another dingling thread. Like, what is he up to now that, like, that phone call ended and he doesn't know where she went? Okay, can I say this again, too? Yeah. This show, more than anything, has taught me about courage. We have the most courageous actors in this show. People walking into, like, warehouses with just a gun, right? And then we have, what's his name? Yes, uh, Will. It's, La- it's kind of like True Detective. They yeah. Just, they just do it. They, they just go. We have Lube Man going into a bunker, and there's a bunch of dead bodies. He's as cool as a cucumber. Um, no? I guess. How, how would you be doing in that situation? I would not be comfortable. Yeah. I somehow changed the wipe on this. Check this out. Look at the screen there. Ooh. I don't even know how I did that. <laughs> this is like PowerPoint 97. <laughs> that's a complete unnecessary wipe effect, and I apologize if that's thrown people off. I didn't off. know it was called a wipe effect. I guess, I mean, he he's an FBI agent. He's got to be at least a little bit comfortable. Oh, wait, now is it doing it by default now? Yeah, it's by default. I, I must have hit some other button on this, and now it's doing that annoying wipe. <laughs> Windshield wipers. Um... So yeah, yeah uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, I would think that that fits. Yeah, there's a possibility we'll never get Lube Man again. We'll never have that resolved, and that would be the funniest. We're gonna leave one mystery, and we're never gonna address who Lube Man yeah. is again. And you know what? It kind of fits though. It's this. It's this idea that you know when people are, when people are costumed, when they are masked, it just creates this this kind of cult phenomenon. You know, and we don't know what people are doing, what they're up to, what their motivations are. Mm -hmm. And it might just be, but you know what though? Like this guy was pretty talented. Right. I don't know how to run full speed. There's not enough Vaseline in the world to let me run full speed and then go into a gutter. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I don't care how desperate I am. I'm not going into a fucking sewer. But like, not, not that I won't, I can't. Like I've never tried, but I'm pretty damn sure I cannot run and then slide into a gutter. As Lube Man or the Blind Salamander. You're not Lube Man. So that's right. I'm, I'm definitely not. Like, sorry, spoiler alert. I'm not Lube Man. Timothy Reynolds says, the device that the 7th Cavalry are building is an intrinsic field generator. The same device that John Osterman uh, used to be turned into yeah, Dr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manhattan. Yeah. And so if they're getting Dr. Manhattan, somehow they're able to use some other device to pull him toward them and have him captive. Are they then taking... If this is still the the Cyclops people, they might still have their own kind of mind control device. You think they could take control of his mind and make him teach them the wisdom of how to become like him? Well, so what's weird, too, 
I mean, yes, maybe. Because who's going to have the watchmaker kind of... Also, he does not reconstitute for like weeks or months. Mm -hmm. And he does so randomly in mess halls. Yeah. So it was a just messy because process they... Yeah. By a guy who knows how to put things back together, but over a long period of time. So, no, exactly. So just because you have the tools doesn't mean you can build, you know, whatever. Shell uh, is talking about you entered a room and saw yourself there. How would you, your brain resolve it? An elephant. So huh? I think that that might be the idea that, like, she's seeing something that her brain can't comprehend, and so she's manifesting it as an elephant. Mm -hmm. Angela walked in the room. She's not, it's not an actual elephant there. She yeah, just yeah, yeah. psychologically can't comprehend what she's seeing, and so she's making it in her mind an elephant. Also, the elephant in the room. <laughs> the big discussion point. Yes. Nice. <laughs> that no one's addressing. Uh, but I don't know. I, I guess it could be a manifestation of her mind. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me because she's still working through all the nostalgia and everything. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Thompson once again says, by the way, no one has mentioned Looking Glass. He butchered those 7th Cavalry guys and bolted. I'm banking on Lube Man, Looking Glass, and Looking Glass team up to rescue Lori. Which, yeah. Oh, that would be sweet. I, think I want little... Lube Man on... Oh my God, Lube Man on Looking Glass's shoulders, like he's giving him a piggyback, but you know, like a nice, sweet shoulder ride. Mm. Okay, like you're like with your son at the at the county fair. Yeah, like okay, uh, like Yoda riding then, on his uh, precisely. Back. Okay, so then when time, when it's important, when it's the right time, mm. yeah, yeah, sweet, nice wipe. I guess that's what we call it now, a yeah, wipe, yeah. wipe effect. Um, sorry, now I'm just thinking of changing diapers. And you say wipe effect. <laughs> okay. Gross. When it's time, looking, looking Glass just puts his head down. Okay. Lube Man slides down sweet 30, 40 degree angle right onto Keen. Okay. Question for you. Pop quiz. Okay. Will Keen survive this? Will he die by the end? Uh, I hope he dies. Yeah. A grisly death. Yeah. Um, Joe Dat Dude says, what's up with a wink after the closing speech? Remember uh, after Miss um, Crookshanks? delivers the, the final speech. She looks at him and gives him a wink. It's like a knowing if they're all supposed to be his serfs and they've all in a way turned against him, is this part of his plot? Yeah. And has he manipulated one of them enough that she is going through the motions that he wants for his exactly. end goal? Look, we know he was there for a reason. We know that he saw this. Like this, this, is a, this is a guy. Go ahead. They're supposed to be such simpletons, right? Like the the little uh, potato babies that he's mandrakes, whatever that he's he's yeah. Putting in the centrifuge and growing up. And it, like part of what he was talking about, like with the problem with them is like, you guys don't even seem to have a proper purpose and that's why you'll never be human. Yeah. But if he can give someone enough of that drive where they do have purpose, maybe they become more of the life form that they're fully intended to be. Well, we look back to the comic, right? Mm -hmm. And... Manhattan says, yeah, I've seen enough life. Now it's time for me to leave and go make some of my own. Right. Now, Vite is kind of, in a way, mirroring that and doing the same thing. So maybe he does kind of see the lemmings and then see, hey, maybe I can take this one step higher. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, we know he's there for a reason. We know he's seen this. We know he's planned this. I don't, You know, this is a guy who who, who brought inter, interdimensional squids and an awesome, like, dog, cat, tiger thing Bubastis. to his Arctic lair. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I don't put anything past him. History Eraser bus Button says, I think Dr. Manhattan sees all time at once and saw Angela stand out in the mix, knowing her past, present, and future, and that's what made him fall in love with her. You know, that's a decent meet cute. I would prefer she's at the laundromat, leaves a bra in there, in the, in the tumbler, and he goes to wash some clothes or dry some clothes and sees it in there and then turns with it on his finger, you know? <laughs> Although... He's precluded from doing that because he's naked. So he would never be in a laundromat. So damn, I got to go back to the drawing board. He doesn't board. wear clothes. Why yeah, he in I know. He just has a weird fetish. I want like you know they they both bump into each other in an alleyway as as burgers and borscht is throwing away a bunch of meat and burger falls on the ground and he uses his nose to just nudge it over to her. Oh my god, so, Lady in the Tramp style. Did you know that Disney Plus has done a new <laughs> updated Lady in the Tramp? You don't because do you have I Disney saw Plus? This. Wait, wait, you saw it or no, you saw I, it? No, I saw that it exists. Oh, man, let's watch it together. Um, just go right, just ignore that. <laughs> just moving past it. 
Uh, let's see. I I think we're moving toward the very end here. Um, Anthony Racanelli says, do these guys look at the comments? And I'll say, now I am. Yeah. <laughs> Finally got Are we supposed to, to? I mean, you're kind of doing multiple things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, History Racer Buzzin says, so did uh, Ozzy's trial take 365 days just listing his crimes? Uh, Pay never testified either. Was it a roast essentially for a year? Yeah. <laughs> Which kind of feels like, yeah. yeah, you're like just really tearing this guy down. And also, why is he wearing his costume? Like, did he get to wash it? How many, how many, you know, is he only just, does he just have one? Yeah, is he just wearing that the whole time? There was a, there was a point where they talked about the creator, like their, their lord and creator or whatever, and um, it made me kind of think, for a while we've been guessing maybe it's Dr. Manhattan that created these people. Like, that was kind of his mission at one point. Yeah. And for some reason, maybe he did this. He created these people. He created a life system of his own. And it's fucking weird. Yeah. Because maybe John Osman's just a weird dude. And then he just kind of abandoned it to see if it might flourish on its own. But maybe it, it couldn't function that way. And so he's like, Vite, maybe you go over there. You can go check this out. I'll give you a chance to see if you can do something with it. Ah, oh, this timeline won't work. I was going to say, what if he did that seven years ago and then he did the car crash thing with uh, Angela yeah, 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 yeah. and now he can't remember that he sent Vite out there and now Vite's stuck there. He's right. like, hold up. I thought we had an agreement. I'd come over here and I'd test this out. I'm just babysitting. Now I'm stuck here. Yeah. What if the whole thing was like, he? he's like, you'll be fine. I can yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. see the future. I think you'll be okay. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and uh, have a life with Angela for a bit. Is that ridiculous? It is ridiculous. That might be ridiculous. Uh, let's see. I should have just had people tag if they have like legit questions so I could just like see them a little bit quicker. Uh, Dina Krusman says, I think mass hypnosis through the TVs uh, she gave the residents um, might be kind of her uh, end goal here, which I think is pretty fascinating too. Uh-huh. Could be that. I forgot that she, she gave everyone TVs, huh? I don't actually don't remember that at all. Yeah. What? When? Uh, when we say everyone, what does she mean? I think Lady True gave everyone TVs. Is there some mention of this? <laughs> she was responsible. Was that in Pedipedia? Now I don't even remember. If so, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't there. I don't know. I think now I'm just kind of rambling at a certain point. Um, Jeff Thompson says, one more thing. Guys, this is important. In case you missed my previous comment, go back to episode one classroom scene with Angela Baking. The map on the wall shows the world flooded. What? Huh? What? The world flooded? Little little transatlanticism album? Most of India is missing. Africa is much smaller, as is America. Well, I gotta look at this. This is fascinating. No, I don't remember seeing anything about that at all. So, shit. I got, I got some work to do. You know Holy what? hell. No, that's that's actually the, that's the most interesting thing I've learned from this podcast. I think uh, I'm gonna have to run through a lot of these questions here, and a lot of these comments, and do a midweek check in, kind of addressing a lot more of this. So you're gonna so you're gonna do a mailbag episode. I'll do a mailbag episode. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you're afraid of that. I love a good mailbag. <laughs> That's what we're gonna do. Okay. Um, but I think this might be a pretty good place to go ahead and wrap up for now. This was a lot of fun talking about episode seven. This was unexpected how much they've addressed in this. Yeah. And you, we can really feel that we're moving toward the finish line. Next week is, of course, the penultimate episode. And if I know one thing about Lindelof, mm -hmm. he loves doing something zany with a penultimate episode. Yeah? Yeah. You think Carrie Coon's going to be in this one? Oh, fuck. Hey, did did the zoom in on Angela remind you of the last episode of The Leftovers? The zoom in at the end on the face? Mm, no, it didn't. But you, I mean, that was a really close zoom in on Angela. No? You don't no. remember that one scene in this in this show? In this episode? I mean, I was trying to do a wrap up, but I don't remember the which wh where when when it turns into her eyes and then it turns into the transition to bite. Uh, I, uh, I don't really remember now, but I just remember thinking, "Ooh, good leftovers." No, when when uh, Beyond is showing those cards, the very first one where the Candyman is handing the oh, candy, yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't that look like Justin Trudeau? Yeah, uh, Justin Thoreau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Absolutely. where I was like, oh, "It's 
there's Justin Theroux. Someone drew a picture of him with like what, sideburns. What did you think though? Because for me, mm. I would have chosen the guy on the kite. With the kite, I'm like, eh, that's nice. He's just out enjoying a nice day. When I see somebody giving a kid something, I'm like, maybe that's just me because I'm sick. There's something a little bit like nefarious that I think you can immediately just like. Associate. Yeah, like we grew up like in the 80s, early 90s. Like, check your Halloween candy. Somebody put razor blades in it. We did not dissect like what this might mean for her that she like chose each of those. Yeah, but like, there was totally something that reminded me of like that movie Men in Black when you see the second set of cards and. <laughs> I know I went to Men in Black, but uh, you see the guy with the knife and the woman that's there? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, nah, she's not scared at all. She's got her hands just casually tucked behind her back. Her neck's just like up. She's leaning. I like how you're affecting a Will Smith accent right now. He's defending himself. Yeah. No, that little girl is studying astrophysics or whatever he's saying. Like, she's about to make a bomb. Yeah. She's the one. He's just, that little alien's just crying. He's got a tissue. He's got bad allergies. Yeah. Like me. Like you. I will get some Zyrtec and Claritin. I'll do a little cocktail, and I will see you next week. Yeah. Um, Folks, we want to thank you so much for checking out uh, this week's episode of Who Pods a Watchman. Please, by all means, if you're here checking this out and you want more of this, subscribe to us on YouTube. Go ahead and subscribe to our podcast that comes out. Uh, I'll post that up right after uh, we end this episode. And you can also help us out by giving us uh, those iTunes reviews and going to Patreon and supporting us there at patreon.com slash who pods a watchman. Make a per episode pledge and help us out. And we appreciate all of that support. And, and while you're at it, go on and listen to a little Star Trek podcast. <laughs> a little, yes, a, a little bit of Star Trek. These fucking wipes are killing me. <laughs> yeah. Are they on the Star Trek podcast? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> it, it, like the, the circle zoom from Star Wars. Right. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but please go ahead and, uh, check us out, support us. Thank you guys so much. And, uh, I guess with that, we will do a good evening, have a good night, and we'll see you in about a week or so. Thanks.